Okay, everyone is 1900 on the clock. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, I think a lot of the people are still joining, but we will respect everybody else who's here. I think 36 participants is a good enough number for us to know that you are keen to hear what Shardi has for us all the way from New Zealand. Um, so thank you so much, Shardi, for joining us. Um, at this ungodly hour for you uh, in New Zealand, it's actually five o'clock on the head um, in the morning. We are 1900 here. Um, so this is actually our first tools and techniques uh, session for 2021. Uh, we had to go through a plenary session to say, how do we pivot and make this more inclusive, not just only for a South African audience, but also a global audience. And that's why we're bringing in also global presentership and leadership to the South African um, business analysis community. Um, Shardi, as I mentioned, uh, is the head of product ops uh, at SECO. Um, she's actually a South African uh, living in New Zealand, uh, left about a year or so ago. Um, thriving and doing great things in New Zealand. Um, a former colleague for uh, IQ Business um, and also did a lot of work for the IIBA South African chapter. Um, so we're really, really very excited, Shadi, for you to be bringing a global perspective to a very global audience. And we can't wait to um, drink from your uh, knowledge cup. Just a couple of the rules. Uh, everybody, please stay on mute until at the end of the talk. Um, only Shadi's video should be off, on. Uh, everybody else is off. Um, we're not doing um, double presentation or multi-presentation, so everybody's in the same room. This presentation will only take about 20 minutes. So with the, the 10 minutes at the end will be for Q&A. So all in all, it's about 30 minutes. Um, you may post your questions in the main chat as she's busy presenting. Uh, we will read them back to Shadi at the end um, in sequence. Um, the presentation that uh, Shadi will be doing uh, will be uploaded to our YouTube page. Um, which is the IIBA SA. So if you search for it, you should find it. We do not send out the deck as, as a rule because some uh, presenters don't use decks to present. Um, um, the IIBA is open for everybody who's a business analyst to become a member. Uh, go to our webpage to join us. Um, uh, this event will be happening every week for going forward uh, every Thursday, to be precise, at the same time, at 1900 hours uh, for the rest of the year. Um, if you'd also like to present a tool or technique to the community, because we know all of you guys are capable, um, you can go to our uh, booking page, which is uh, the calendly.com Jobex sessions, tools and techniques session. Uh, just book a slot there and then you should be able to also be like Shadi um, and we can also care from you. So with that said, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the presentation. Shadi, welcome. Thank you for, and thank you for the team that's right for setting everything up and planning all of it. Um, I'm going to do that little awkward thing right now where I'm going to stop presenting and then I'm going to ask the questions like, can everyone see my screen? All of the, you know, the usual stuff. Um, can I just get back control of the screen quickly to uh -oh. be able to give it to me? Let me just make sure. Um, okay. Yeah, you should be able to. You co-host. That's right. There we go. Okay. And okay. So I'm going to ask that annoying question right now. Can everyone see my screen? I can see you. Yes. Okay, yes, so okay. And, you can see, and you can see the presentation view. It's only it's only the presentation, not the Thank you for that. View. Okay. Thank you for that intro. And we're hearing someone else is killing the background. I'm very happy to say that um, I'm also at home and um, you might be hearing both a cat and a little toddler in the background. So if you do hear that, yes, that is me. 
thank you for being here. I know you all have important things to do. So this is a very personal journey for me. I get often um, contacted on LinkedIn by BAs that are coming up through the ranks and they would ping me and say, but how do I move into a product role? And how do I get people to, to think that the BA has got a lot of similar skills than a lot of product roles? So over the years, I've asked this question, been asked this question, I've answered to my best knowledge on LinkedIn, I've had calls with people, and then I've been asked by the IBA in New Zealand to do a talk on this. And several of them have asked me to come here and just give you guys some of the talk as well. So this is not a tool and technique you teach in 20 minutes, but this is a journey and there is some real takeaways and things I can teach you guys or help guide you guys on how to move into those kind of roles. The first thing to know is when you are moving into this kind of role is that it's all about a mindset. It's not so much about your skills, it's about the mindset. Now I'm giving a pre-warning here and a precursor. I have got slides in here, what I call trigger slides, because they're in there on purpose to make you think, to talk about it. If you are triggered, good, that was the intention. Um, some of you, half the audience will be triggered by some of the slides, the other half will go, yeah, that's how it works, that's what I know. So it's interesting, depending on where you fall on that, you've got to go and do some research. So the first thing here is this quote, to say at its fundamental product management is looking at value and it measures value and encourages value over achieving milestones. That is at the fundamental what it's all about. So I'm going to show you guys a slide right now before we delve into the other things that I famously stole from Accenture. I'm going to just put it out there. Um, this is work that was done by Accenture. But this is the essence of the product versus project mindset. The ones I want to focus on first of all here is the customer and business value, I think. When we talk about product versus project, for us, it's not about milestones. It's not about reaching on budget, in time, with all of those things. You know that iron triangle people keep talking about. The biggest change is in product, we are talking about the outcome and the value the outcome achieves. Value here is not always revenue return. That's the other big change to think about when you talk about the product world. Value could be market share, which sounds like revenue, but not necessarily. It could be testing our assumptions. It could be testing the appetite for change. There's a lot of different things that we can do as value. That's a significant switch to the old traditional product line. Another one here that's important is the life cycle. We know that we cannot plan this upfront. We're not going to have a big plan that we can break down into little steps and just follow it like that. It is a evolution. We know it's ongoing. We know it's emergent. And as we start delivering value early on, we are going to get feedback and we welcome that feedback and we're going to respond to that feedback. That is another change about it. The third one is the way we, we look at people. So some people might call it resourcing, please call it people. How we manage people, how we get people together. We don't assemble teams to work on a project. At the end of the project, disperse the team. We try and keep people together. We want to keep teams stable. We want to keep them working together. We want them to find their mojo. And we want to keep giving them different types of work. The other thing we talk about a lot, and this is directly impacting the BA community, is we talk about just-in-time requirements. You still need to do analysis. Analysis will always be needed. It's, it's something that is critical to delivering a good product. But we talk about just-in-time. When we start off, we do our research. We do a lot of research. We do our viability. We do our squats. We'll use tortoise five forces. There's a lot of different techniques we look at when we do analysis. When we start building, we do just enough analysis at the right point in time to understand enough to start building and testing our assumptions. We don't believe by doing big upfront analysis all the time, um, things are going to go perfectly to plan and just be like that. We'd rather start experimenting earlier and getting feedback earlier. So one of the examples, I was lucky enough to work in 
both a typical project-based company as well as a company that was moving towards the product mindset when legislation rolled out. So think about the example of ICA. Um, I think most people on this call with either from a professional or personal perspective have come across FICA already or something similar to that. If you were in the project-based company, when the legislation came in like FICA, we had the PMO, we had a project office, and they had this mandate. Legislation-wise, we had to do it. If we didn't do it, our CEO, CTO might end up in jail, and the company could face a whole lot of penalties if they weren't compliant. But they did an audit of all their products, well, they didn't have products yet. They had an audit of all the projects and all the lines of value they had in the company. And we did an assessment to say we needed this many teams, we're going to form this team, and we were going to go out and we were going to roll this out. Some of you might have seen some of these um, implementations where, when you tried to, I'm talking about a few years back, when you tried to get FICAD, you would end up going to, for instance, your bank, sorry, banks, you would go to your bank and you would end up having four or five different products of the bank, and you would have to get FICA on your check account, you would do FICA on your home loan, and in the end you like kind of, but I've already been FICA bank, you know me, like stop asking me for this information. I had a situation where my bank was both giving me proof for FICA to give to other instances, but yet they were asking me to FICA with them for a different account. It was like this really bizarre situation. And it showed, it was completely the, the company, the bank, just went and checked their boxes to say, we need to be thicker, we need to comply to this legislation, click, click, click. We didn't care how we impacted me, the end user. We just did that. And I bet you if you went to that project office, they were very proud of themselves because they implemented it, hopefully, on time and budget. And um, they weren't penalized. They were, did a really good job. They did great projects. The projects were there. They delivered horrible customer experience. It was the most bizarre, frustrating experience. I saw a product company approach it in a very, very different way. They looked and said, okay, this is coming in. It probably is not going to be a fun thing for customers. They're probably going to be weird about it. Our customers only care about this when they can't access their accounts. They don't care if we're compliant or not. It's just when we actually freeze their accounts. How do we make this a feature in our, um, in our product? And how do we make it as painless as possible? They went out and we did the user research. We did stuff like the customer journey. We did the empathy map and that we understood what their real need and concern was with this new legislation came out. We launched a product, a feature on our product that made it very easy and user-friendly for people to get that figure. They did it once. It was handled really, really well. And it was a non-entity. It became a feature that it was done so easily. Very, very different approach. That is at the essence of that mindset change that we're talking about when we talk about product. So if you're thinking, if you are in a company that was product or project-based, one of the asset tests, if you want to call it that, you can do is if your company is focused more on throughput or on the amount of things that you're building and how much work your developers are doing, if they're focusing more on that, you know, if they're focusing on outcome, and value being realized, chances are you are on a project-based company. Whether they call them product or not, you're probably in that world. Other things to um, mention out here is the fact as well that we talk about um, following the plan. So it's not about following the plan here, it's about delivering value. That's also the most important thing. We know things will change. Um, we also measure, feedback loops is very, very important here. We measure and we get feedback often. That's very important to us in the product world. So let's talk a little bit about our roles in the product world. If you have a look at that, if you see people doing a Venn diagram like this when it comes to roles, then you know it's as clear as mud. <laughs> um, I, I took this particular one, and I'm not saying this is a good one. I'm not saying it's correct. It's just to show you the complexities around this. Um, there are so many things out there. You will see so many different Venn diagrams. You will see so many different websites dedicated to this. So I'm just showing this one again. 
the first one of the trigger slides I've warned you guys about, um, to talk about the most common roles in the product world. If you look at this slide here, you'll see that they've got the word PM on there. In their case here, it is project manager. It's not even a product manager, which was interesting. They've got the BA on there. Yes, absolutely, there is space in the world of product for BA. Don't think that it doesn't exist, it does. There is the product owner in there, and there is PM. They're both project and product manager in there. Another one that's quite prevalent that's not on here, and I don't know how popular it is in South Africa, but it's very popular internationally, and I'm seeing it a lot in New Zealand, is product analyst, which is not on the screen here. Um, I think the one that's currently causing the most confusion is the product owner one, and we're going to touch on that one on the trigger slides just now. All right. I um, warned this up front. This is coming with a warning here. So product analyst is an interesting one in the sense that depending on the company you're in, when you read this statement, you're either going to look at this, shake your head and go, absolutely, that's what they do in my company. Or you're going to look at this and go, where did you find that? So interesting one in my company I work at currently, in Circo, we do have product analysts. And our product analyst is business analyst. The company made the intention choice to call the business analyst product analyst to make sure that everyone in the company is focusing on product mindset. We're moving towards being a product lead organization and people to approach everything like that. They made this choice. And then, interestingly enough, after that, when people started applying, when we were hiring new product analysts, and they put it out in the market with that title. The people that applied for the role ended up being people with uh, this expectation. So we ended up getting a lot of CV that we had to do. Uh, the people applying were actually market. The noise, the noise. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if everyone else can hear that. I'm getting quite a bit of feedback. Is there one else hearing that? Um, I'm going to just ask if anyone can please remain on mute, that this really will help. So in our organization, that caused a lot of um, problems there. When I did a poll with the guys in the community in New Zealand on product analysts, most of them came up with this statement. When I asked them and I said, what does a product analyst do? And we had a couple of options. Most people came back, significantly so, 83% of them came back to say, they do market research, they do the customer polling, and they help to choose the new products. Not quite the same as a business analyst. You can see there's some correlation. BAs possibly could do a lot of this, um, but not actually. It turns out the role was created initially as a stepping stone between a business analyst moving from a BA role to a product role like a product owner or PM. They didn't know how to distinguish between them and they just came up with this title. Be careful when you apply for these kind of roles, really, really go read the job description. Then the most common one, um, I know you would have seen in South Africa, is product owner and product manager. Now this product owner statement on here right now is gonna be a big trigger for some of you. And some of you are gonna go, but I don't understand why is that a trigger statement? I'm going to give you a few seconds just to read it and really read it. Okay. So in my career, um, I have played the role of business analyst. I started off being a developer that moved into the business analysis space. Um, in fact, the first role I played was an analyst developer. There wasn't even a business analyst title in my company at that point in time. They didn't even know what it was. From there, I grew into being a BA. I spent a lot of time being a BA, senior BA, lead BA, um, and all of the ones that went along there. And the one company where I was a lead BA, we discovered I was doing a lot more actually than what traditional BAs would be doing or what the actual description of a BA would be. I got given a title internally called a product manager. And because um, I was just not doing traditional VA work. 
after I left that company, I went to a company where I was called the product owner. Now, depending on where you are in the world, if people hear that and they see it in your CV, some people might see that as a demotion. Others see that as a promotion. So this is where if it was a live event, I would ask you guys and say, do you see this as a promotion or a demotion? So I'm going to ask you guys to quickly put that in chat for me. So here's the question. Do you think going from product, um, going from a product manager title to a product owner title, are you seeing that as a demotion or a promotion? You guys can pop that in chat for me. Demotion, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people come demotion, promotion. Mm. Mother, it's a different poll. <laughs> Chicken and egg. Yeah. Some natural moves, that's interesting. So that's quite interesting. Yeah. No, I don't know. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. In the context of those two companies I worked with, when I moved into the product owner role, it was a big promotion. When I moved into that product owner role, suddenly I was fully responsible for that product. I was responsible for the budget, success, adoption, um, accountable for that product basically succeeding and failing. Not responsible for all of it, but I was accountable. Go to market strategy, all of those things. The actual return of investment, the cost of acquiring new clients, I was responsible for all of it. Understanding the market share, the achievable market share, how to reach it, how to bridge that gap, that was all my responsibility. But it's very interesting that even in South Africa, we, I thought we had a much more defined um, understanding of it, but we got a mixed bag. So the product owner, a lot of people, you also hear the statement, they say a product owner is a role you play on the agile team where product manager is the actual job, you'll hear statements like that being thrown around a lot. There is two completely different views out there when you see the product owner role advertised. The one is this one I put on here that is expecting you to be very tactical and you're going to be executing on the backlog. That's all you do. Um, SAFE and frameworks like that have even made it worse. They really have split the line between product manager and product owner. So when you are applying for these kind of roles, please make sure you read those so carefully. When you go into the interviews of these kind of roles, ask those questions. What is the responsibility of the product owner? If there is PMs in the company as well, where do those boundaries, where did the handover start, where did they end? That's very important for you to understand that. Because either as a product owner, you could end up, and excuse my language here, being a PMs bitch, being the, the personal assistant, or you could actually own your backlog and your vision and just be more than just writing the company. Very important to find that out. Second one here that also causes a lot of problems now is product manager. If you look at this statement here, is it either going to ring true to you and this is how you understand the role, or it's going to trigger you? Very important. Then you are to read that. Product managers could be anything from people that look at the market who are completely strategic looking at that to being a product owner and a product manager and a marketing specialist and everything rolled into one. Again, please go read the ads when they get there. Product manager and product owner can be very, very confused. And a lot of companies just end up just going with one of the titles that mean both things. Be very clear on which one you are seeing there. Okay, so talked about the roles. You are a BA currently, you wanna have one of these roles. So how do you do it? Well, number one, know yourself. So very important here, when I first became a business analyst way back in the day, um, 
we were always told, and this used to really, really upset me, that if you were a business analyst and you wanted to look at your career path and growth, the next step for a business analyst would be to become a PM. And in that line, it wasn't product manager. It was a project manager. Who on this call can remember those days? There must be some people that are old with me. There was a lot of that going around in the industry to say that the career path, the promotion of the BA is to be a PM. Very much like I said back then, I never wanted to be a project manager. It was never for me an option as a career path. I did not see it as a promotion. I did not see it as the next step. I saw it as something very different. Um, that's why I was quite encouraged and quite interested to see some of the feedback on the call today coming through like that. It's the same thing here. If you love certain aspects of your job that you're doing right now that really makes you love business and business, you might not have those same elements in a product manager or product owner role, depending on how the company you're going to is interpreting it. There's nothing worse than moving into a role where you don't get to do the things that you love about your job. So really, really know yourself. Go ask yourself what it is about the BA role that you really enjoy. What do you really love doing? Please, that's very important. If it is being down in the details, if it is really unpacking and problem solving these things, go ask, go focus, do some introspection about what elements you really, really enjoy, and then decide. I'm going to make this call now and this caveat now. Um, it is not a promotion for BA. There's a full, rich path of career growth out there for BAs where you can become a senior BA, you can become a lead BA, there's business analyst managers, there's a lot of different things. There's the enterprise um, business analyst, you can go into business architecture. There's a lot of different paths to go in. Please don't think you have to go either product owner or product manager. Really think if that is something you want to do before you just jump into that step. That's important to note. Secondly, create the gap. Your company might not be product at the moment, but you can start introducing the thinking. I worked in organizations where we were not fully product and we weren't even thinking like that, but we started creating the gaps where we started focusing on the client elements of it. We started changing how we wrote solutions, how we thought about solutions, how we did our analysis. Create your gap. So go and start applying that thinking, applying those things to your organization. You don't have to sit and wait for organization to say, oh, we're going to be product-led and we're going to give you the product title. Um, I currently, at the moment right now, I'm recruiting, but I have also have promoted one of our internal product analysts, in my case, read business analyst, um, because they've shown the gap. They've shown that they can actually fulfill that role, that they think like that, and they're approaching their work like that. To your organization, you might be the change they need. So don't just wait for that. There is a lot of talk out there at the moment. Um, and if you look at articles and you're reading things like this online from the project managers, um, product managers, you'll see one of the things that gets said a lot to people wanting to move into this role is if you really want to show you can do it, is to go and start a sideline hustle, start your own product and do that. Um, I don't know about you guys, I don't have time to do that. Um, you don't need to go to that length. If you can, if you've got a great idea and you can do it, do it. Other thing about creating the gap is look at communities like this one, see if there's any startups out there that is looking for some skills. If you want to go in there and volunteer your time, you can go do that. That's another way to get some runs on the scoreboard or practice the skills or demonstrate you have done the skills. But Often I say the easiest way to do this is to do it where you already are working right now, to start applying these things and to start thinking like that. Community. Find a community. Like the IBA is already doing great work. Uh, you would have seen if any of you are members on the call, and I'm assuming a lot of you are, the IBA has launched the product owner guide that we put there. So they are really bringing that role into the community. So find study groups, find groups that are discussing it, go familiarize yourself with that body of knowledge. Find community in South Africa. There's the product tank community. They will work closely with the IBA community. Start looking for groups and meetups and things that are product focused. There's a lot happening in the organization um, between the IBA and the agile community. There's a lot of things happening all the time and things like that. 
join in, get to know people in the community, start networking in that community. Find a mentor. So most product people, just like VAs, are really, really busy. And if you approach them and you go and say, please, can you be my mentor? They'll probably be overwhelmed. So I get asked this quite a few times as well. Or I get people reaching out to me and say, um, I'm looking for a mentor. Can I talk to you about that? If I see that post coming on LinkedIn or that message comes on LinkedIn, um, most likely you're going to get an answer to say, thank you very much, but I can't. But because I've got so much happening, um, I moved to the other side of the world, new jobs, um, two and a half year old daughter and all of that. I just um, know that if I do mentor someone, I want to do the best for them and I'm not going to have the time for them. So my immediate reaction would be, I can't let someone down. I'm not going to take this on right now. However, what people have been doing and that's been working well is instead of asking someone, will you be my mentor, to ask to say, can we have a call? Can we have a coffee? Can I pick your mind about this? Can I ask about this? And I'm quite willing to do that. So are a lot of other people out there. So when I say find a mentor, I'm not saying um, mail someone and say, will you be my mentor? Rather reach out to someone and say, I'm interested in this topic or this section, or I want advice on this. Can I talk to you about that? It's a lot more digestible for people. If you break it down like that, they'll make time to have the conversations with you. I cannot stress that one enough. Speak to people in the community. Find that mentor. In job postings, go look and see. Go look and see in your country or the country you want to move to what they are advertising. Get a feel for the understanding in your market. What is the product owner job looking like? What is the product manager job looking like? And make sure it is the one that you're thinking of. Like I showed you just now, those two trigger statements I put on there for product owner and product manager is just one of 100. If you're going to go Google it, you're going to see so many different ones of them. So very important, go read the jobs, see what are the skills. So what I said to everyone is take about 10 of these jobs, 15 of them, the companies that you really admire and want to go to, write them down or do a word cloud and see what words come up the most and look at those underpinning skills and see and measure yourself to see how do I measure up in those? Do I have those skills? Can I do those things? If you don't have them yet, that is a mini little plan for you to work on your development to see, okay, they say I need to have this skill. I need to work on that. Um, I need to work on that skill. So that's a very, very good way to bring your skills up to date. Another thing is also go look at what's in the job postings. Look at what you're doing today and what is transferable skills. That's also important. Formal training. So with, when it comes to product management, management um, in specific, this is a difficult one. There's a lot of training out there at the moment. There is no official certification for product management. You will find in the product ownership, there's a Scrum Alliance, a Scrum.org, there's IC Agile. There's quite a few bodies you can go to that you can do certification for that. The product owner one is also with IBA. I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to be coming out of the certification because they have launched um, the body of knowledge. So there's a lot of things already in place for that. When it comes to the actual product manager role, it's interesting, it's a very old role. It's actually much older than the product owner role, but it's still very fussy. There is a couple of groups out there at the moment. There's product school, there's um, mind the product, there's the 280 group that are currently doing certifications in this area. None of them are recognized or official. Um, we're not looking for any. None of the companies out there yet are looking for any. I would rather invest the money in doing short courses, practical things if you don't have the skills. It's going to mean the same thing for you than writing a very expensive international certification with one of those institutes. There's good things on LinkedIn learning. There's good blogs out there. There's good podcasts out there. There's a lot of good books out there. Um, I'd rather, and that's going to be my next point here, I'd rather say invest in those for right now than to try and do expensive certifications that aren't recognized. Uh, like I said, that's for product manager. There is a lot available for product owner. That's a different way um, of looking at it. The last one, like I said, is books, blogs, and podcasts. Start following people. 
The only thing I am going to say with this is just remember the people that are writing the books, blogs, and podcasts, number one, look at the market they're in and take it with a pinch of salt. Um, not everyone is in Silicon Valley with the startup culture and being that level where you've got companies like your Facebooks and Googles or the companies who will have 300 or more um, product manager roles available. They'll have entry product manager roles available. It's not the same. It's not the same in a lot of companies. It's not the same in a lot of organizations. They don't have that kind of background. So when they write their blogs and they write their podcasts, it is also slightly skewed to the world they live in. So take that with a pinch of salt. Take the underlying things out of that. Really good principles, good techniques they teach. But just realize your world might look different. Um, talking about owning a vision, coming up with a vision. I think the reality check, if we do have any product owners or product managers on this call, very rarely, unless you're part of a startup or a new product line, will you have full autonomy over a vision. Your vision and your strategy most likely is coming from a greater organization strategy or a greater product strategy. And you can own your vision within that, but you're not going to have that clean scratch back from that one. So just be careful when you read these things. You'll see statements written there like um, the product managers and the CEO and stuff like that. Be careful what you read about things like that. People writing their books and putting it out there, that's their product. That's their brand. They have to also sell it. So don't take everything in there as law and suddenly think you've got to change your world to fit that. Have some common sense when you read those things as well. So that's what I wanted to share about that. The last thing I'm going to say is when you're writing your CV, because this is a question that comes up a lot um, from people pinging me on LinkedIn, is I don't currently in my organization have a product owner or product manager title. How do I get uh, recruiters to look at my CV of that? Cover letter. Cover letter is important and transferable skills and acknowledging it. So when you apply for roles in product, Pull it out in your cover letter or the email you send to them to say that currently I don't hold the title product owner or product manager, depending on the role we're looking at. Um, I do do these skills and highlight the ones you do, though, to say um, I might not have the official title in my organization, but in my organization, the BA role looks like this. I do the following skills that is product manager or product ownership. So show them the transferable skills that relate to that. And that is me. So question time. I'm going to just end the slideshow so that we can have a quick look at the questions coming up. Thank you so much, Shadi, for an amazing session. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat and we would like to apologize to everyone who has joined in. We are aware that we're running over time. Apologies. But I think Yes, apologies, and we would just like to ask Shadi a few questions. Um, I've got one question from Mutodi, and uh, the all right, the participant is asking, what about feature analysts? So I'm um, yeah. So that is the question that has been placed in the chats. Yeah. So the feature analyst is going to depend a lot on how your company is structured and that. A feature analyst is probably more like, like my business analyst, what we call it product analyst, what they are in my organization. So they've got someone that runs just with one feature and those analysts, they specialize. So it's like a mini specialization within that organization or that value stream. It's going to depend on the organization. So that's where it fits. It's not a... A traditional, I wouldn't say it's one of the traditional product roles. Um, it's depending on the framework and how that company has structured their delivery teams. So it's just, it's a naming convention. That's what I'm going to say. It depends. It's going to be hard to say without looking at your organization as a whole. They're probably doing the BA work. Okay, thanks, um, Shadi. The next question that we have on the post um, on the chat says, uh, would product owners sort of define the requirements and the BA does the documentation and analysis? So that's interesting. Um, we have, um, yeah, they can. So here's the thing. The product owner has accountability for making sure there is a backlog. It's stocked. 
is communicated and shared with everyone. That's accountability. It doesn't mean responsible. A lot of product owners I've worked with don't have the skills to write really good user stories and good coverage of acceptance criteria. So they will partner with a product uh, with a business analyst and the business analyst will actually go write the stories for them. So it's the difference between accountability and responsibility. Thank you, you for that. Have a smaller, yeah, in smaller organizations, depending on where it's coming from, you might have a product owner that is also doing that role, depending on the size and their skill level. Thank you for that. So the other question is from DN. Uh, she's asking, can a single person play both the PO and PM role? When would it not be a good idea? That's a very good question. It's an interesting question. So when I asked about, um, I see the product owner being a demotion or promotion, that interpretation of that company and how the product owner role was written in the Scrum context, it actually is a combination of both roles. So they defined it in there that you do look after both those elements. So that split that you have at the moment in your mind between the product owner and the product manager, they actually see it as one because you really, for them, the ownership, you own everything about the product from feasibility to adoption and sunsetting one day. You own that full life cycle. Can one person do all of it? Yes, if they understand the difference between accountability and responsibility, they know where to delegate it. You might not have all the marketing knowledge or any of the other knowledge, but you're accountable for all those things happening for the product to succeed. It's about making sure that you delegate and getting um, the jobs done that needed to be done. But will one person have the skill set to do all of that? Very doubtful. And will they have the time, time to do all of that well? No. So in that context, you really need to delegate and have a good team around you. Um, Trevor is asking if product analysts um, are expected to be technical meaning that they have some kind of systems analysis experience. Yeah. Um, Trevor, it's going to depend whether your title product analyst or your definition in your organization is the product analyst statement I put on there or like in my organization. So mine, because they are business analysts more than our organization, they are quite technical. Depending on the team that we're hiring for, some of them are quite technical. We've got a very big platform section to our work and they do a lot of mobile work. In there, we've got the product analyst or more systems analyst, if I can call it like that. Um, so it's all going to depend. If it's the product analyst, like they had them on that um, quote there, no. If they're on that quote, if they market specialists in that sense, um, they will be specialists in the market and they'll do market research. So they're not normally technical in that context then. Um, all right. Um, the next question, James is asking, why, where are the marketing teams and the definitions? Yeah. So um, marketing definitely is there. So the marketing is whether you're doing product or not. Marketing is one of those roles that have been around a lot. Um, James, I did not put marketing on here on purpose because uh, we only had a limited amount of time. <laughs> That's the one. Um, and secondly, uh, when people normally contact me with our backgrounds that we all have on this call right here, they're not ne necessarily looking into a marketing thing. Again, marketing is a critical element of this. And as a product owner or product manager, depending on how it's interpreted in your role, you have to work hand in hand with them. So I've got my market specialist. I've got my marketing team because we do our go-to marketing strategies together. We do our launch plans together. We do all of that together. Um, I don't do it myself, but as a product owner, you would have the accountability to make sure it happens. And that's where it's important. Um, I cannot stress that enough. You'll hear me say that a lot. It's your racy. It's who's accountable and who's responsible. As a product owner that's fully entitled and the fully empowered mm -hmm. product owner, you are accountable for all of it. Uh, thank you. Another question uh, on the chat uh, says, are the roles PM or PO strategic roles or tactical implementation roles 
and would an MBA be beneficial in this area? Yeah. So there's a lot of that going on with me about the, a lot of people that I've heard have said to me that, oh, I'm going to do my MBA because I want to be a product manager. No, no, you don't have to. If you've already got your MBA, of course, it would be beneficial in the way you think about things and how you approach it will be beneficial. But so would any other studies. So it's about how you approach things and things like that. It's not unnecessary. It's not something I look at for a CV when I'm hiring for my team. Even I'm hiring for a senior right now. It's not something I'm going to um, look at and make you more viable as a candidate for me than anyone else. Um, I think what I would say there is the, the, the PM and the context that I'm saying it right now and a company that has got a PM functionality, they don't have product owners, but they've got the product management and they've got VAs. In that context, the product managers are probably more strategic. They are focused more on strategic level they're all looking after those kind of things more. So from that side, I would say there's more benefit for you to go do a financial accounting or accounting for business um, thing. Do go do that. Go do a light marketing course. Go do that kind of things. Because you're going to think about stuff like your market share, your cost of acquiring your customers, um, servicing your customers, you know, that kind of thing. That's where your focus is going to be, validating those kind of things, looking at that stats, looking at those kind of things. Strategically, where it's going looking at your OKRs, how the company achieves these things, forecasting of revenue, returns, and you're going to look at revenue models and stuff like that. So I'd say in, in that context, it's more strategic on that level. There are companies where the PM role is, again, defined, and it's very much defined exactly the way that the Scrum Guide will define a product owner. The PM in that context owns all of it, Okay, and in that sense, you are both operational, you are tactical, and you're strategic. So there are companies that split them up quite a lot like that. I would say a good PM has got all three of them. You are operational, tactical, and you are strategic. Your strategic side will probably be the biggest one, um, and you'll have less on the tactical one. The, the, the PO role I put on there, so if you're a product owner, and you are actually operating more like a backlog administrator, you're going to be purely tactical, okay? But that's not what the role was intended to be. There is a lot of those positions out there. That's why I say be careful, really read those job postings well. Um, um, how, does the, how does the product architect fit into the product space? Yeah. Again, that is going to be something that you're always, depending on the organization you're in, so architecture fits in with our space like anyone else. So when we look at our product delivery teams and we look at the makeup there, we have architects in there and we've got them working just like we would have an engineering manager and we'd have developers and stuff like that. So they absolutely fit in there. They are one of the go-to people for my PMs when they are looking at viability. So when they're looking to see, is this the right thing? We're looking at feasible, we're looking at desirability, but we're also looking at feasibility. And how do we make this and how do we implement this and how do we make good quality performance decisions and stuff like that. So when it comes to the quality of my product, absolutely they one of the team there. Um, so they fit in there just like they would with any of the other teams. I think one last question uh, says, where does the business architect fit in? in the product space, if at all? So the business architect will fit into that strategy and they will fit into the, so your strategy distribution will probably go from your objectives of your organization and that will flow into your technical and product strategy. So they will be across all of that. They will make sure that when you've got your vision and you've got your key results and things that you're achieving that you're not ruining off course, that you are keeping true to your mission, they'll help with that. They'll help in the in the bigger picture. If you think about the system thinking, they'll help to make sure that your vision is still within that and that it helps you to achieve that. There's absolutely space for that. Um, we've got an enterprise, we're calling it an enterprise business analyst, but it's actually a business um, architect that also works along us. There's a lot of things that we need to do as an organization that is not purely fitting into one of our value streams right now. And that's where they come in. And they actually, now our enterprise business analyst actually has a team 
and they focus on those kind of things. So it's absolutely something that's in parallel to our normal value streams, our normal product. So I'd say they in service of product and complementary and they work hand in hand. Cool. Um, Shadi, I think that was the last question for the day. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much uh, for one, waking up at ungodly hours okay. and two, for answering our call when we actually called to say, you know, we, we know you, you are a good analyst, but we know you much more than what you are. So share some of the knowledge of us and you embraced it. I think everybody on the line really enjoyed your session. So thank you so much. Uh, and apologize to the husband and baby for waking you up so early. I feel sleeping. <laughs> so I'm not going to apologize. Ever. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to do put it out there as well for everyone in the call. Number one, apologies for overrunning. And then the second thing is if there's a question that wasn't answered today and you do have more questions, you're all welcome to ping me on LinkedIn. Um, there is a difference in time zone. So I'm probably not going to respond immediately when you say that. But if you do have questions, please do ask. Um, I'm happy to answer. I will send out to Teppo. What we can do is um, I've got a, when I did the full talk, a um, much longer talk on this, I have got a list of some of the blogs and some of the online groups and that if you guys want to go have a look at that, it's good resources to look at for online classes and blogs and articles to go read if you're interested in this field. And I will share that with Teppo and the team from the IBA. Thank you so much and good night, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 B